the following is continued from the Han playlist. In the med lab of the Night Rock, an illusionary holographic specter of Navi stands over a suspended Han, fully clothed. Per standard squad protocols, Han is having Navi add his new specs and modifications to the ship's emergency database in case of injury or other need. Navi seems quite impressed with what he has detected, noting the near invaluable materials that were now augmenting and supplementing Han's systems at nearly every level. Data transfer, reaction speeds, perception, damage mitigation, and so many other systems were now operating at a baseline that exceeded most other known Christons in existence. Of particular interest to Navi was not the uno-proto-substrate that was now a part of all nerves and neural tissues throughout Han, nor the advanced modifications to Han's skeletal frame, but the addition of a power generator in what had been previously a massive power storage bank. The bank was still there, and tied into the same sub-series of systems that could, for a prodigious cost of energy, augment and elevate any of Han's other systems to incredible levels. Previously, Han could store roughly enough power to operate the Night Rock for a day at maximum flight speed, but even that amount of power would last only a few minutes at best when being used to overcharge his system. This new power generator would be able to provide all the power Han might require, and a good deal more it appeared. Both in raw power and in functionality, Navi was in awe of the design and components, unsure of where one would even obtain such things, much less give it physical form and function. Before he could speak about it, Han's head snapped up and he began to give Kirk direct orders as he got out of the scanner. Navi was to prepare and enact a full lockdown of the mech suit bay, including anti-divine measures. Before Navi was able to confirm the orders, Han was already halfway to the suit bay. Entering via a concealed entrance on the upper gantries, Han saw the stooped form of a man performing some kind of work on the internals of his mech suit. Having given away his actions by tripping an internal security measure in the suit's interface systems, Han silently sent the order for Navi to enact the lockdown, and as soon as it happened, the man's head popped up, quickly scanning the room to find Han staring at him. The face greeting Han was perhaps the last one in the realms that Han was hoping for, but perfect for what he had in mind for the situation. Verisar Skychild's wry grin was as charming as it had ever been. He began to compliment Han for catching him off guard while he was distracted. However, before he had spoken a word, the harsh reality of Han's fish striking his jaw, sending Barisar to the deck below like a falling star from heaven, followed by the feel of a barrel placed none too gently into the base of his skull after he impacted, made it clear that Han was not in the mood to be annoyed. Han proceeded to give his former commander a single opportunity to spare himself the loss of a head and the direct trip back to his divine realm. Han demanded to know why Verisar was there, what he had been doing to Han's suit, and above all, why he felt it was necessary to kill over 300 innocents to steal the very suit, under cover of its disposed destruction, just to upgrade it and have it returned centuries later. The ever slightly increasing pressure of Han's rotator pistol ensured that Barisar's next words were from the heart. And in less than a sentence, Han had withdrawn his pistol to hear the full truth 
as Barristar soulfully began. The truth of his suit's potential threat and the truth of its link to the Sky Care. With a tone Han had never heard come from Barisar in the millennia of service with him, he learned that the material at the core of his suit's power plant, a near unique psychoactive protomatter mass of extra reality origin, was in fact the reason for Barisar taking his suit, covering it up with an operation that saw not 300 advanced detachment personnel slain, but 300 Simdons. Simdons were full Criston bodies, minus the vital Onichrist and thus a soul or real life, piloted and controlled by a ship's main computer with simulated personalities. This was a measure to reduce the number of personnel required to keep the advanced division going, but one that was on a need-to-know basis as to maintain security. What made that core material worth the loss and the effort to retrieve from Han in a manner that implied its destruction rather than its theft was that the larger portion which Han's team had properly turned over to Criterion R&D had been used for and the terrible results of that use. Where Han, the creation and son of one of the greatest technical minds of the Analar at the height of their knowledge and power had used the material to create a stable generator capable of near infinite power generation. The larger mass of the material had been put to the creation of a series of shield generators for the Criterion flagship, the Moon Gem. All small scale tests show that the resultant defensive fields would be nigh unbreakable, and the system was fully brought online for the first time when the Criterion fleet faced off with a Reviver fleet over Jamamar. With the vast amount of power that shielding a five mile long capital class vessel took, the system, instead of creating an unbreakable bubble of defense, punched a hole in reality instead, creating the Sky Care and ensuring the loss of both fleets into its vacuumous maw before it dissolved. In the aftermath of the incident, Barisar had remembered that the material Han had fairly kept from their discovery and what he had used it for, and thus formulated a plan to mitigate the possible danger. It wasn't till decades of testing later that Barisar realized Han had gotten it right. The mass was sealed and completely stable. Verisar, to his private shame, was not fully clear how, as even he was unsure at the full mechanics Han was employing, but it was stable and safe. That is when he had rebuilt the suit and all the upgraded materials as an apology. By the time he was done, Han and his team had left the advanced division service and gone into the wind before Barisar could reach out, and other matters of divine import had called his attention away. Now, he was here with a new set of upgrades for the suit, based on data sent to him by Jaxum, to bring the suit up to par with Han's new abilities and capabilities. With a flicker of his form and a smile, he reported that the work was now done, having used Tim Porces in some way to finish his work. A soft reminder, while Han had been able to catch him off guard, Verisar was still one of the realm's most capable and dangerous heroes, divinely empowered or not. Asking Han to unlock the bay so that he could leave with a soft smile, he tossed a disc of twisted metal and crystal over his shoulder to Han, stating that when Han could return it to its true form, he'd meet him in the arena any time after it was returned, if Han was of a mind to settle things that way. As Verisar openly mused on why Naiwi had chosen Han for this endeavor, Han sent the all clear and awaited the disengagement of locks keeping them both in place, 
while preparing for his next set of actions. As soon as the seal was broken and the door opened, Berthar just walked out, and Han and his suit vanished in a quiet flash of teleportation, most likely off to answer Verisar's previous curious musings. Verisar, of course, noted this, and as soon as Han was gone, he softly asked himself the real question on his mind after getting a good look at Han and an in-person look at Jackson's new work. How did that lich make a generator that seemed to produce grace? Where did the creator of the Christons find the means to do that? The following happens concurrently with A Long Night in Farmhold, Series 3, Entry 28. In a nondescript room, two Dragwa and their Manari brother were enjoying some strong drink while relating the details of their latest assessment of the brewing farmhold versus deep law conflict to a tall man wearing stark and unblemished white clothing. Ari Reason, one of the God Emperor Prices of Dominica's top advisors and general regent of the home realm holdings of the Empire in his absence, listened intently to the information. Not only due to agreements between Dominitra and both parties of various kinds, but to know exactly what manner of father had seemingly grown on the southern edges of Dominitra's sphere of influence. The array of assets being deployed by Deep Lock was rather impressive, if totally out of proportion for what such a kingdom should be able to field. The initial war machines acquired from Ego Core had apparently been replicated by the smith of Crater's Drag several times over. At significant increase in cost per unit, it should be noted. It seemed a fair guess that this was to hide the true number of their forces, and if not for the brothers' caliber coming across the facilities doing the work during their hunt for Cathian, instead of the ten super heavy transport and support platforms they were aware of, they would have been caught unawares by the additional 120 the Forges of Crater's Drag had produced, not to mention the additional 12 Skyborne carriers that were also construction, all with their complements of Skyships included. Based on further information they had been able to gather during a 6-hour infiltration and reconnaissance action into Deep Lock, it was clear they were start and marshalling supplies and gear for a force numbering well above 300,000 troops. However, they were only able to find transport capacity and uniforms for just over 100,000 warriors, and they had no clue as to the meaning of this discrepancy. Even 100,000 troops, however, with the support of the air and super heavy transport, it was a force on par with what most of the greater powers might have fielded during such turbulent times as the Wars of the Spark. The brothers' assessment of Farmhold's defense and chances was heavily couched in one repeating thing. That if they could complete their planned preparations, they stood better than even odds of being able to endure and outlast their attacker's ability to prosecute a protracted siege. Their shield generators, as well as internal defense turrets and other systems already in place and functional, would already prove to be a steep obstacle to overcome, but not one that could hold back forever those kinds of numbers or assets. However, if they were able to complete their construction of artillery and other weapon systems for the city, they would be in possession of one, if not the largest artillery parts on the face of the home realm, consisting of several different realm techs, from the Teltechians to the Rodkin's advances and creations, alongside tried and true Chris Tech. Before the brothers could continue to the disposition of farmholds, troops, and other military assets, a door to the room opened. 
being a door directly open to a fall from the side of a cube of upper two, old Polaron, this did catch the attention of all in the room. The fact that it was a lich, wearing Analar robes of antiquity, didn't even fully cognate to the brother's caliber as they first became mist and then were rapidly drawn into an open tome held by Ari, itself a focus to aid him in the managing of the vast multiples of infinite power he was in charge of as the stabilized, blue flame reborn, Tragedy of Avarice. The brothers were only manifestations of the merest fractions of that power, and they had served Ari very well in that capacity, but they had no place in the presence of this guest, one who had not seen the outside of his workshop since he became a lich, or so went the tales. For an instant after closing the tome and looking back at Jackson, Analar first. Ari saw him as he had been. Tall, powerful, but with an air of confidence born not of pride or surety of his designs, but of absolute determination to see his duty and task not only done, but to the highest degree. He practically oozed with quiet and unshakable resolve. Blinking again, Ari just saw the lich and welcomed him in, asking his business curiously. What was of such import that Jackson would leave his home instead of just calling for Ari, who would not have dared to refuse such an invitation? Jackson explained he was here to seek a boon, a favor to be repaid in future, and tossed a piece of star metal with all the details engraved on the internal structure to Ari. Ari's faith on going over the information was anything but pleasant, as it would see him use that power that was his curse and duty in a way while seemingly well thought out and more than considerate of any possible hazard, was not one Ari had ever considered or contemplated. The old lich wanted Ari to help him right the failings of his own past to give his creation the power that he was intended to always have, but never receive. Jackson stated there were others he could go to, but none with the ability to be as safe and controlled as if he worked with Ari. Ari grimaced after asking Jackson how long he had to decide, being informed that Han would be at Jackson's lab in a few hours at most. Ari grimaced knowing that Old Lich had waited so long to prevent Ari from being coy or ambivalent in his answer, and smiled as he realized the fact he hadn't discounted the request out of hand was as much a sign of his willingness that he was already forming the first line that would be needed to help one of the least sung heroes of Jamamar in a rare case of him needing help. A paper from Jackson wouldn't hurt either, Ari thought as he began to write into his tone, following the forms and directives provided by that very lich. If you'd like to contribute to the further exploration and explanation of the realm, please consider leaving a comment, a like, and sharing the video around. I read all the comments and make efforts to reply to each. Thank you for helping to grow the channel and know I look forward to each and every one of your comments. Other methods of support can be found in the channel's description. Thank you for watching.